Okay, since I happen to be the last speaker of the conference, I want to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for, our, for this wonderful conference. <laughs> so for the last three years, I come here every year. I fully expect to be here next year. And, and Okay, so first of all, it's, it's quite clear this has been a, a, a very big conference with a broad range of interest, so I'm not going to be reviewing the content of the conference. This would be practically impossible. I, I would end up saying nothing about everything. Instead, I will say, I'll try to say something about a, 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 a small topic uh, which involves uh, the doing fundamental physics experiments both with big colliders as well as with small uh, scale experiments like uh, Mina just, uh, just told us. So let me begin uh, with the, the broadest possible perspective of length scales in, the, in our universe at least. Uh, so we start uh, on the right, you have the Planck length and 60 of orders of magnitude further to the left, you have the size of the universe. And this is the arena inside which uh, physics uh, takes place. And uh, the standard model, as you see, occupies, occupies this small island in this uh, vast uh, arena. And uh, uh, this is where we know we have the best information so far. This orange thing is the LHC. And uh, right in the middle of this uh, logarithmic range, uh, perhaps coincidentally, is the dark energy as well as the scale of, of neutrino masses. And uh, these are essentially the scales that we have explored in high energy uh, physics, what's called high energy physics or laboratory fundamental physics. Now, the main problems that have been occupying us since essentially the late 70s when the standard model began emerging as the dominant theory uh, of the universe are two problems. One is the so-called cosmological constant problem, which is simply why is this uh, range of energy scale so vast? Why is the universe so large? Why is the universe so much larger than the Lagrangian parameters of, of the standard model? Now, this is such an outstanding problem that there has not been a satisfactory, a dynamical solution proposed uh, uh, to solve it so far. And uh, I will have uh, uh, little to say about it in the rest of this talk. The second hierarchy problem that has attracted a lot of attention when there have been ideas is the so-called gauge hierarchy problem, which is the, uh, the statement can be expressed in many ways. Why is gravity so much weaker than weak interactions or electromagnetism? Or equivalently, uh, why is the separation between the weak scale and the Planck, uh, the Planck scale uh, so large? And uh, this has been the main guiding force for physics, what we call physics beyond the standard model, for the last uh, 35 uh, years or so. And uh, there are, in, a, in stating this hierarchy problem, there are two aspects to it. One aspect is to explain what's called the stability of the hierarchy, uh, namely why isn't the weak scale as big as the Planck scale. It turns out that quantum corrections of the standard model, for example, tend to increase the weak scale towards the Planck scale, tend to compress the scales together. And uh, so that is called the so-called radiative stability problem. Then there is the problem of actually calculating, computing the ratio of the weak scale to the Planck scale. So on both of these, uh, for both of these aspects of the hierarchy problems, there has been a lot of uh, progress in, uh, and uh, this has been the guide for uh, building the LHC, for you know, building LHC detectors. Uh, the hierarchy problem has been the guiding force. Now, what are solutions, uh, approaches to these problems? I'll show at least, uh, there's at least four. 
One solution is just to fine-tune the theory or give up. Say that, well, if you fine-tune parameters to 30 decimals, you can ensure the separation between the weak scale and the Planck scale. And, uh, well, I have nothing more to say about it. It's essentially restating uh, the problem. The second class of solutions are so the so-called natural solutions. Natural solutions are those which can, as I said before, explain both the stability of the hierarchy against quantum corrections, as well as compute the, the magnitude of the hierarchy, at least in, in, in principle. And they come in many categories, historically starting with uh, technicolor, supersymmetry, then uh, uh, large extra dimensions are the three examples of, uh, of uh, natural solutions. Uh, the explaining naturally the weak scale invariably involves new physics right at the weak scale, which is, of course, about 100 GB, the mass of the W and the Z. Uh, so in the early 80s, when, for example, uh, Technicolor as well as the supersymmetric standard model were, was proposed, uh, we expected to find new physics around 100 GeV, and we expected the new particles that explain the new physics, for example, the superpartners, to be, roughly speaking, half of them below 100 GeV, the other half above 100 GeV. So we, we expected uh, uh, you know, phenomena to enter at LEP, as well as, especially, at the LHC. As we know, nature hasn't so far been so kind to us, and at least in the context of supersymmetry that I will mostly focus on, uh, there has been the so-called, uh, ironically called the missing superpartner problem, which is that we've looked up to mass scales of around 2,000 GeV, and, uh, uh, and we haven't seen anything yet. In particular, we haven't seen colored superpartners, and color superpartners such as the gluino are very special because they couple a lot to, to the, they are the very, the easiest things to produce, at least as far as their interactions are concerned, at the LHC. So, tremendous bounds to colored particles, which are about a factor of 20 above the, the mass of the W and the Z. So, uh, given that these particles are a factor of 20, heavier than we expected, there is a tuning of about 20 squared, one part in 400, in typical theories, in sort of unforced uh, theories, uh, supersymmetric theories, for example, uh, uh, at, as, as they stand. Now, you may argue that one in 400 is not so bad compared to 30 decimals, and it's true, and it may still be uh, the case that uh, LHC 13 uh, will discover something. However, the fact that we haven't seen any, anything yet uh, uh, you know, raises questions as to, to what we should expect. One can reasonably argue why do we still believe in, in supersymmetry. After all, the hypothesis that we shouldn't be tuning parameters is an aesthetic hypothesis. This is not a logical inconsistency of the theory. And there is one more reason why we believe in supersymmetry beyond the hierarchy problem, which is the famous gauge coupling unification, that uh, the you know, supersymmetric theories account naturally for the relative strength of uh, strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces, uh, supersymmetric grand unified theories, whereas uh, standard model grand unified theories don't. So that was an aesthetic, uh, this was discovered experimentally in 91, ten, 10 years after it was predicted theoretically, and that formed the basis of the tremendous enthusiasm in the early 90s about uh, uh, the prospects for seeing supersymmetry in the, in the near future. Okay. You've heard quite a bit in this conference about uh, model building that tries to account for why we haven't seen supersymmetry uh, yet, attempting to build untuned, or what are called natural theories, and there is a variety of them. I, I won't say details about them. There's, there is the colorless top partners, for example, the idea is called twin Higgs and folded supersymmetry, whose basic idea is that uh, to consider theories where the cancellation of the quadratic divergences associated with the, with the top mass uh, can be done by colorless uh, particles, colorless uh, uh, partners, 
colorless top partners. And that, uh, these theories, uh, I mean, people are very interested in these theories, and they are one way in which nature may have chosen to avoid tuning. Typically, these theories uh, don't unify very simply, and one has to, one loses the minimality that led to a beautiful prediction, you know, calculable prediction of, of unification, and one is invariably involved with more complicated theories. Similarly, uh, there is a, a class of uh, theories which uh, have what you may call double protection mechanism. Namely, they have TV size dimensions, for, to be precise, around five TV size dimensions, and, uh, and also supersymmetry, supersymmetry in the bulk of these dimensions, which uh, can also be natural, natural at the level of you know, 20 or 30 percent tuning, which is essentially no tuning at all. So uh, they, may, they may be a, a route nature has chosen. One is a little suspicious, at least I am a little suspicious of these theories, even though I was involved uh, with them, because the, it seems like you know, the less we see, the more we assume. So we assume more, and they sort of, you know, this double protection coming both from extra dimensions and supersymmetry make the theories natural. It seems counterintuitive, but it's a logical possibility. In the end, you know, physics is an experimental science, and LHC may reveal if these theories are there or not, at least at the, up to about 10 TV. Then there is another class uh, of ideas uh, which in fact also involves extra dimensions, which is the so-called auto-concealment of supersymmetry inside extra dimensions. And the idea there is very simple, I can tell you without any pictures. Uh, imagine a theory, a higher dimensional theory, where there is a, a bulk, there's an extra dimension, whose size is, let's say, you know, an inverse GV, uh, let's say a Fermi or longer. Okay? So it's a, a quite large extra dimension. Uh, one or more, and imagine that the particle, the next to light a supersymmetric particle, the one that can be produced in colliders, lives on the brain, whereas the light a supersymmetric particle is a higher dimensional particle, it lives in the bulk. Then it turns out that the next to light a supersymmetric particle, when produced, tends to decay, of course, to a number of the Kaluza-Klein excitations of the lighter associated with the lighter supersymmetric particle. And just on phase space grounds, on higher dimensional phase space grounds, there is many, many more heavy Kaluza-Klein excitations, the light ones, so it tends to decay, the, the next lighter supersymmetric particle tends to decay to the heaviest ones, which means that there is a little bit, there is a small amount of missing momentum uh, uh, left uh, which is you know, a key signature for uh, uh, trying to detect uh, supersymmetry. So it turns out these theories uh, that uh, uh, can account with tunings on the order of 10% can account for uh, the absence of any signature so far of, of supersymmetry. And there, is other, uh, there are other ways to do it, uh, at different levels of, uh, at different levels of fine tuning. A, you know, there is something about fine-tuning, an aesthetic aspect to which, which, which is not really easily measurable, which is the complexity of the theory, like, you know, the inverse of the number of assumptions that you have to make, or the, you know, new states say that somehow has to be involved. And I don't think these theories pass the criterion of uh, uh, that, that, that uh, intuitive criterion. It seems like we have to really complicate our theories to... Uh, explain why we haven't seen anything. Or we can just admit, which is simple, oh, well, the world is tuned to one part in 400, and we're about to see supersymmetry. The problem with the latter argument is that once you admit uh, that you're willing to tune to one part in 400, why not to one part in 4,000? There is no, you lose the principle now. You lose your principle. So, and of course, if things are tuned to one part in 4,000, you won't see anything at LHC 13 either. Uh, so this is the state that we are in. So the next three years will be spectacularly interesting because we will test at least the principle, the naturalness principle, to some, uh, to some high precision. Now, this brings us to the next approach, 
uh, the so-called environmental approach, which is extremely controversial. There are very strong opinions on both sides. It's like Greek politics these days. So uh, the, and it has been going on for a decade. Uh, the historical, uh, in order to present it in the best possible light, I will draw on a historical uh, analogy. So once upon a time, people thought that there was just uh, one solar system. And at that time, there were you know, deep physics questions and deep mysteries. One deep physics question was to explain the distances of all the planets from the sun, yeah, or from each other. Which, uh, so this, uh, this was the problem of physics. It's a very natural problem. Once you believe that there is only one solar system, this becomes the problem to explain. And also there were mysteries. In particular, one mystery is, why is the Earth habitable? Why are the conditions just right, the chemistry, the distance of the Earth from the sun? It's not too close, or else it would be too hot. Not too far, it would be, or else it would be too cold. You know, just the right chemical elements are found on the Earth. So it, it, uh, it looked like if there was this one solar system, this was a natural question. Uh, these are natural questions and natural mysteries to ponder about. Of course, now we know that there are, in fact, many solar systems. Oops, I went. Many solar systems. Uh, and of course, in the presence of many solar systems, both of these questions evaporate. So if you have, uh, like we have, like 10 to the 23 solar systems uh, in our universe today, then the distance of the uh, various planets from the sun are not at all important anymore. They're just historical accidents. And uh, also the mystery that we were alluding to, for why does the Earth have just the right chemistry, etc., uh, to allow for us to flourish, uh, is also just a question of uh, some statistical uh, accident that can occur when you have many, many many, many uh, samples. So uh, what used to be fundamental question, if you thought that there, were, there was one solar system, becomes trivially explained once you postulate that there is many solar systems. Notice that even if the, so, the solar, our solar system was surrounded by an extremely dense cloud, so dense that we couldn't see anything outside our solar system. We wouldn't know that there is other solar systems, galaxies, etc. Even if there was such a cloud, the hypothesis that there are solar systems would completely annihilate what we consider deep questions or deep mysteries and change our perspective. Now, today we are in a situation where uh, for uh, at least the last 15 years and, and, and more, in a situation where a, a small minority uh, suggests that there are many universes, the so-called multiverse theory, whereas the vast majority, of course, be, still believes that there is a, a, a one, one universe. So if you're in the one universe camp, the, things like the cosmological constant problem and uh, the hierarchy problem have a completely different uh, phase level of, uh, level of importance than if you are in the multiverse camp. For example, Weinberg used the multiverse to argue that the magnitude of the cosmological constant is determined by what's called anthropic consideration. So if you have many universes, then you introduce in your toolbox two new tools. One is called uh, statistical reasoning, Maybe you'll be able to argue that the vast majority of universes has a specific properties, like, let's say, low energy supersymmetry or, or something, something like that. Or uh, you also introduce in your toolbox what are called anthropic tools. You can say, well, there are many universes, and we live where we can, where uh, the conditions are right for us to, to exist. So it completely changes the, what we call change what we consider question that should be explained by dynamics or what is a mystery, like the hierarchy problem or the cosmological constant problem, completely change our point of view. And uh, 
Uh, people have been thinking a lot about uh, this. It's a very difficult topic to think about because if you think about a multiverse, we have no, next to no idea actually what this multiverse looks like and what the properties of typical universes are. So there are huge debates among the few proponents about what is typicality and is typicality really important? The famous question, why am I not Chinese if typicality is important? So there is a, a lot of uh, uh, issues that can not be debated very well with mathematics. And uh, nevertheless, uh, there are some potential implications for LHC 13 of this point of view that I'm not going to go over in detail. These are 10 year old uh, 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 discussions. One is uh, the class of theory which is called split supersymmetry where only a fraction, only the fermionic supersymmetric particles are light and the bosonic ones, the squarks and the sleptons are super heavy and uh, not accessible to any, any collide, at least not accessible to LHC and possibly beyond. So in that theory it turns out to have many practical advantages. It, it still has gauge coupling unification. Uh, it can still, uh, exp it explains why we haven't seen any rare processes or CP violation associated with supersymmetric particles. Uh, simply because uh, all of these problems, these issues arise from the scalar superpartners, which are now very heavy. And another possibility that is uh, suggested by the environmental approach is just the standard model. Yeah. And that is uh, uh, something that uh, ca cannot be excluded. If you say just the standard model, you lose gauge coupling unification and uh, you lose possible candidates for dark matter, maybe the axion, if the standard model is enriched with an axion, maybe the axion can be a dark matter. So it's a complete change of point of view of where you would look for new physics. Okay. So this so-called philosophical debate has huge impact on how we think about the future of high energy physics and whether we should pursue more intensely you know, the low energy frontier in addition to the high energy frontier, etc. Now, I on purpose presented the most positive perspective on the environmental approach simply because it doesn't have a lot of supporters. But now I have to give you a huge reservation that I have, which is, and I'll tell you another story. Some time ago, I won't yet tell you when, uh, there was a biologist from Harvard University, a professor at Harvard called L.J. Henderson, who wrote a book. You can see the title. And inside the book, he, what he was trying to do in this book was to derive all the properties of atoms from biology. So his main principle, he called it the biocentric principle instead of the anthropic principle. His main principle is that the laws of nature adjust themselves to allow for life to exist. Now, can any of you guess when this book of, was written? Not the ones who know it. So this book was written precisely in 1913. This is the very year Bohr introduced his atomic model. So had this book been taken very seriously by the physics community, it would have strongly discouraged the development of atomic theory and quantum mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the huge warning. There is the fear of premature application of the anthropic principle, which can prevent us from progress in thinking and in physics, in looking for truly dynamical explanations of phenomena. And it is never easy to say when it is premature to apply such principles, if, if at all, if applying them at all is, is legitimate. So this is one of the debates and one of the warnings, and this is one of the reasons why at least most people I know, especially myself, you know, I find most of the time, you know, one day a week, being in an anthropic mode and six days a week being uh, misanthropic or against the anthropic principle uh, mode. 
And uh, it, it's just this concern that we're somehow giving up too fast, whatever that means in this case. Of course, uh, OK. Now, then there is another approach that I want to get to, which is called a historical approach. Uh, and I'll give you an example of uh, historical ways to explain small numbers. Remember, we want to explain uh, you know, small numbers. Uh, so one possibility is the historical approach. Uh, an example in today's universe that is not at all controversial is that the small matter energy density of our universe today uh, is just the result of time evolution. The universe has, is old. So if you can explain why the universe is so old and so big, then you can explain why the uh, matter energy density is small. Okay. Now, this principle was taken seriously by Dirac for explaining fundamental constants. He was worried about the ratio of the proton mass to the Planck mass, and, uh, which is, uh, and he postulated that that ratio is time dependent, that it was bigger in the early universe, and as the universe grew, it got smaller and smaller. Turns out his theory has been now, uh, at least the simplest implementations of his theory have been disproven by observation by observing for time variation of fundamental constants, as well as from the fact that Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, is, uh, measures things like the Newton constant and you know, the parameters of proton mass uh, fairly precisely to, to uh, a level of few percent. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we know that even as early as three minutes after the birth of the universe, they, they, they had the values they have today. Now, uh, Abbott in 85 tried to uh, apply a similar historic approach to explaining the smallness of the cosmological constant. Uh, and his attempts were very interesting. Uh, they, they used, uh, I, I don't have time to go in details, but uh, they, they, they used uh, inflation time evolution during inflation, time evolution of an axiom-like scalar field during inflation to account for the smallness of the cosmological constant. His theory didn't work. It ended up with an empty universe, a universe whose cosmological constant was small, but so matter density was, uh, was zero. Okay. And also it suffered from other problems that he wasn't aware at the time, which is called uh, uh, the time evolution of his field was uh, dictated by quantum jumps, not by classical motion of the field as he, he was using, but by quantum jumps because uh, there was eternal inflation uh, during, uh, during his time evolution, uh, during the, the, uh, the inflationary era of his model. Now recently, Graham, Kaplan, and Rajendran uh, uh, had proposed a new approach to the hierarchy problem which uses uh, Abbott's ideas, and, but applies them to the hierarchy instead of to the cosmological constant problem. Uh, as far as I can see, R Rajendran gave a talk uh, on this. And as far as I can see, their, uh, their, their idea works, at least at the effective field theory level. Uh, and it's very interesting. It does create a new set of challenges that uh, are interesting to address. For example, the mechanism relies on extreme transplankian uh, expectation values for scalar fields. And now we're talking about really you know, 10 to the 30 times M Planck and, and mass scales inside the Lagrangian, which are like 10 to the minus 20 something electron volts. So there are very big parameters and very small parameters in their theory that beg for an understanding, especially the transplankian waves. The product of the very big and very small give you ordinary, you know, they give you the cutoff of the theory, which in, in, in their simplest model is uh, on the order of 1,000 TV. So instead of having new physics right at the weak scale, they have new physics at exceedingly small mass scales and exceedingly big field. Uh, and the product of the two gives you essentially the weak scale and on all the normal physics. So they avoid having, you know, distinct thresholds. Uh, around the weak scale by, by this huge separation of scales. So this presents field theory challenges that are, uh, I think, very interesting. But they open a new window. 
And in some versions of their theories, there are experimental consequences. Uh, and so it uh, could be a very interesting direction to, to, to look at. And now I'm going to switch uh, to, the, to saying just a few words about small-scale experiments. Uh, small-scale experiments, are, well, it's, they are very easy to motivate. Uh, if you look at this plot, the standard model, what we know in, from particle physics uh, covers about 20% of the energy budget that is available in these 60 orders of magnitude. And there is another 20% left to explore. And uh, so in particular, there are good theoretical. Uh, uh, there is you know, a plethora of theoretical ideas where there are new particles at energy scales that are uh, both to the right as well as to the left of the energy scales that we have we explore. So it's natural in, in, in such a conference to ask why are we talking about uh, low energy or small scale experiments. And one is theoretical, which I just said. There are particles like the axion, dilatons, or phenomena like extra dimensions, et cetera, that uh, uh, have been around for a while, that uh, uh, theoretical ideas, or even standard model particles like, uh, well, gravitational waves in, in particular, that, uh, uh, that have been around that have not yet been tested. Uh, in addition, there are experimental, tremendous experimental breakthroughs of a variety uh, in a variety of experimental fields, like we heard from uh, Mina before, uh, there are there is what's called the high energy, uh, high precision frontier, where you can measure quantities to excruciating detail, you know, 18 decimal precision, from which you can extract, you can do fundamental tests, tests of theories, fundamental theories that predict phenomena at large distances. Uh, there is also the so-called coherence frontier that I'm not going to say uh, much about, uh, where you produce you know, highly entangled quantum uh, states that can lead to ideas for new detectors, detectors detecting very small momentum transfers, for example, uh, based on the fact that they can cause decoherence among a correlated uh, EPR uh, pair. So. Uh, and then there is sociological. That's a sociologist that is just great to think of new things. I, I find them very refreshing. I've been thinking about small-scale experiments for a couple of decades because I think they are fun. And they also explore some relatively overlooked but interesting theoretical as well as experimental ideas. And it, it may also give, uh, especially young people, uh, a lot of fundamental physics to do in the time scale between experiments. Experiment, time scale between experiments is now you know, a couple of decades between colliders. May easily be a couple of decades, and it gives you lots of uh, interesting things to explore. And uh, this I've already mentioned. So here are a couple of particle or a couple of things in the standard model that remain to be explored: are gravitational waves. I shouldn't be calling it gravitons, and, and cosmic neutrinos. Uh, in and as I said before, in string theory. There is axions, which are probably the best motivated particle beyond the standard model. Uh, that is not supersymmetric, at least. And uh, so uh, the, because it solves a strong CP problem, it's dark matter candidate. It's just, I mean, it, and if these uh, ideas of, co of uh, historical solution of the hierarchy problem are true, they may even aid the solution of the hierarchy problem. So they are very well motivated. The kinetically mixed photons. The photons that new U ones that kinetically mix with our photon and dilaton moduli, new dimensions, all, all kinds of stringy phenomena. Uh, lots of experiments have been proposed to look for this, and I will. I'm not going to read through this other than to say a few physics points related to atom interferometry. I just want to impress upon you why, for example, one of the many tools for the high energy frontier called atom interferometry is so amazing and why it can go so much deeper in precision than interferometry with photons, OK? So here is a, a reminder of how photon interferometry works. 
photon interferometry, you have a photon. This is very similar to the Michelson-Morley experiment. Ah, okay. <laughs> you are not the head. <laughs> I'm your anyway, ex-advisor. So, okay. So uh, maybe I'll go very, very fast over this. Essentially, if you have atom interfer uh, photon interferometry, a photon uh, splits its wave function in two parts by a beam splitter, and then uh, so an up trajectory and a down, uh, 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 an upper trajectory and a lower trajectory. And uh, the idea is that you, you, you collect the two components of the wave function of the photon by mirrors, and then uh, the two components interfere, and uh, you measure the interference pattern. Okay, so that's the idea of interferometry from the time of Michelson, uh, etc. Uh, and these experiments are usually, you know, one meter large experiments. And the precision of this, the accuracy is like the wavelength of light divided by the size of the experiment. You know, this is the, uh, and the idea, uh, going back again to Michelson and Morley, is that if you encounter different physics on the upper trajectory than the lower trajectory, then this will manifest itself as a, as a shift, as a fringe shift in the interferometer. For atoms, you do exactly the same thing. You, instead of a photon, you have an atom. And instead of doing it in x and y, you know, in space, space, you do a time, space, time interferometer. So you take an atom, you apply a laser pulse, which splits the wave of a function of a single atom into a fast, uh, into a fast and a slow component. And then another mirror pulse reorients the two components of the wave function of the atom to come together and interfere. And again, if there is a difference in the, in the physics of the upper and the lower trajectory, you'll see a fringe shift. Now, the big difference between atoms and light is that atoms don't have to move at the speed of light. In fact, atoms can be made to move extremely slowly, like a cent, you know, centimeters or, or meters per second. And, uh, and uh, as a result, the experiment lasts much longer. So there is a much longer time, even within a one meter interfer interferometer, there is a much longer time in which to build a phase differential between the upper and the lower trajectory. And that in, uh, manifests itself in increased sensitivity. And uh, this is the sort of uh, you know, one minute reason for why you can uh, accomplish 18 decimal precisions uh, Okay. Now, I don't have time since my ex-student pointed out to me, uh, okay, yeah, maybe I'll skip all this. The, the atom interferometry ideas have been applied. Ah, this is state of affairs as of a month ago when I was at Stanford. Uh, now they managed to separate the wave function of a single atom by 58 centimeters. And this is a sort of world record to have a, a massive object split its wave function into two parts that are separated by over half a meter. And they are aiming to do this uh, by, by several meters. At Stanford, there is a 10 meter interferometer that, uh, so this is called the Schrodinger cat state, a state that is, you know, a non-relativistic state that is uh, 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 that, uh, of a single atom that is separated by such a large system. And the precision with which you can uh, do experiments is proportional to this separation. So having a, because it, the, the bigger the separation, the more different the paths are, and the more you can probe physics differences along the two different paths. Okay, now these can be used to test gravity at, uh, at large distances. So, for example, test the equivalence principle in the near future to 17 decimals. Test things like the nonlinear nature of gravity, uh, the fact that gravity gravitates uh, to, oh, to, to a high precision. Uh, right now, the precision is one part per thousand, and uh, the precision will increase by two or three orders of magnitude. So, this is in particle physics lingo, this is called the three graviton coupling. So the three graviton coupling today is known to one part in a thousand, and uh, and it will be known to better. And also the statement, you know, that if you, a moving object has kinetic energy, so it gravitates. Okay, you can use these ideas. I don't have time to discuss to 
to make gravitational waves, gravitational wave detectors that are far smaller than uh, gravitational wave detectors that are based on light. And simply because of what I was explaining before, with a smaller experiment, you have much long, you can test much longer time scales, therefore much longer period gravitational waves. So you can imagine building a gravitational wave detector uh, that is comparable to existing proposals uh, that is uh, much smaller in size and has you know, different and better characteristics as far as aircraft control, etc. So you can have a 1,000 kilometer uh, setup that compares with the LISA, which is 5 million kilometers. And uh, right now, what is going on at Stanford in the basement, uh, not uh, with uh, real experimentalists, God forbid I, I would do an experiment. These are uh, uh, people that are experts on atom interferometry, uh, Kasevich and uh, Hogan. So they are testing equivalence principle. Right now, they are about to do 15 decimals and soon uh, to 18 and, uh, and all the other things. Now. In my last thing, I've spoken about, oh, if you sent Giovanni, it would be much more effective. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the, lots of ideas have been discussed uh, of small scale experiments to do fundamental physics both existing and future uh, uh, ideas. And uh, the question that I want to ask is whether it would be worthwhile to think of a paradigm for doing fundamental, phys fundamental small scale physics experiment where all these different experiments are housed in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same home. Okay? So in a, in a sense to build a super lab for fundamental physics as a paradigm for how we should be doing low energy physics experiments. And uh, so what is a super lab? Well, a super lab is a lab, is a big lab that has many small laboratories in it. So let's say a, a, a huge building that houses 20 fundamental physics experiments. And uh, fundamental physics is what, what particle physics think of as fundamental physics, new particles, new forces, new dimensions, new, 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 new phenomena, beyond the standard model phenomena. Using any experimental te uh, technique, high precision or high coherence frontier, and having it run as a user facility with a few local people, physicists, a lot of you know, computer and machine shop and resources support, uh, you know, top level personnel support, sort of like CERN but mostly being a user facility for small-scale experimentalists to go and do their experiment. Uh, there are, one can think of several posit, you know, pluses and minuses of this possibility. I, I'll just, I'm just listing some of the pluses. The pluses are because having lots of experimental lists uh, at least spend part of their time in a common environment increases uh, interactions. It, it has coherence effects that are enormously important. The whole idea of a university was to have coherence effects. Many smart people thinking together about related ideas. So it can be an ideas incub incubator. You can share lab resources like machine shops and technicians and engineering. And it defines a new field. It defines the field of fundamental small scale experimental physics. And it gives sociological opportunities for the field. For example, you know, places like that um, essentially are not going to pursue high-energy experiments in the you know, 10 TV, 100 TV frontier. This could be a new vision for investing these public uh, resources. Uh, these such a laboratory would cost much less than a high-energy experiment, so it could be you know, even affordable from just one or a few uh, private donors. And uh, it also would be very good. It would give fun things to do for, for young people as well as old people in, in, in between colliders. And uh, 
that's an idea that's out there that is attracting a little bit of attention that I don't have, you know, I shouldn't talk anymore. Uh, so last 50 years, physics has uh, the, the frontiers of particle physics have been focused on high energies and colliders. I think the next 50 years will have colliders plus small scale experiments to, uh, to keep us uh, happy and excited. And uh, I want to end again by thanking the organizers for such a wonderful conference. All right, so since we don't have time for questions, maybe we can ask people to ask questions and, and just relax. And lunch will be there, so no problem. Any questions? Can I ask a question? <laughs> so no, I wonder whether there is uh, some motivation to make this uh, lab underground or not. I, I think there could be. First of all, the, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting that there should only be one, because the cost of such a laboratory is minuscule compared to colliders. So you can easily have lots of these labs uh, around the world. And for so some experiments would benefit from being underground. Uh, several would benefit from having, for example, a very quiet environment. I mean, from the point of view of vibration, seismic. So th that would be helpful. But they don't all need to be uh, underground. Those that are obviously sensitive to cosmic rays would benefit, and, yeah, and seismic backgrounds. And I, I'm, uh, as I said, we are really talking about, I mean, people typically ask me to cost it. Such a building would be on the order of 100 million euros to start, but then if you have several experiments, you know, there is a, the annual maintenance is a more, a more important factor than, uh, and the, the thing that we had in mind <coughs> was Perimeter Institute, a, a theoretical experimental <laughs> analog of Perimeter Institute, and he's a rich person who is... <laughs> Mina. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, but that's, yeah. All right, so I think maybe we should bring this to a close, and let's thank Savas for a very inspiring uh, talk, and again, the organizers.